John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. Uh, this is God's word. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you may bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And we thank God for his word. Okay, it says you're offline, give up with that. Okay, let's just see where we go. John chapter 15. And I'm going to be relying on my memory, and I've got a Bible in front of me. Keep an eye on my time in case I go for half an hour at this point. Right, I was, during the week and I was preparing, I was uh, directed in in my thinking to uh, Jim Carrey, and I'd watched, I, I was directed to watch a video clip. It was from the 2016 Golden Globe Awards, a bit like the Oscars, I suppose, in, in that situation. And there was a lot of excitement as he was making his approach uh, onto the stage to be able to make that presentation to, to somebody else. And uh, the noise and the excitement, the music, uh, and then the announcement came. And here is now uh, two times Golden Globe winner Jim Carrey. And he comes on and everyone's getting really excited. And then Jim Carrey gets up to to the front and he's about to... Okay. Thank you. It works. (laughs) She's not trusting me to say say that. And um, I probably can't go without it now. Okay. And getting on to to the stage and he says, Yes, indeed, I am two times Golden Globe winner Jim Carrey. And he began to play on it a little bit. He's evidently ad-libbing with, with what he, he's doing. And so that announcement sort of took him by surprise. And then he says, you know, I, when I get up in the morning, I, I am not just any ordinary person. I'm not just any ordinary man. I am two times Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey. And actually, when I dream, I don't dream like any other ordinary man. no. When I dream at night, I dream of three times Golden Globe winner, Jim Carrey. And he evidently knew who he was speaking to, and he knew the sort of things that resonated in the hearts of these people. And they're all, that all these people think that these things are genuinely important. And this is the most important aspect of living, is winning these things and these accolades. And he's doing all of this with the biggest, that big smile that, that he has. And then immediately, just like that, he changes his demeanor and he gets serious. And as he gets serious, and with a very, very straight face, He then goes on to say, he says, when I finally get that three times Golden Globe winner, when I finally get that, then I know that I will have it. But then he says something completely unexpected. And he says, then I could stop this terrible search for what I know ultimately won't fulfill me. See, Jim Carrey realizes that what these people think is important. And he had been doing some soul searching because this was his first public appearance on that night since his then partner had committed suicide. And he had been reflecting deeply. He had been thinking about what was really important. 
And as he wonders, what is the thing that we really are searching for in life? And as I come to think about this Bible passage today, which we routinely would think at a harvest time, and maybe to try and take a slightly different tack with it again, I'm also recognizing that as I'm speaking at the front of church now, is that you, all of you, me too, will be searching for something at times. And we're all searching for different things. And we're searching for meaning. And we're searching for satisfaction. And we're wondering what all this is really about. And as I read the Bible, I'm directed to think that what the answer is and where the answer is found is that it is found in Jesus and specifically in a relationship with Jesus. And so Even this picture where Jesus now, I'm going to direct you to John chapter 15. If you have this Bible passage now in John 15, this image where Jesus takes, uh, where he calls himself the vine, and it's about fruitfulness, and it's about a life that is fruitful, and it is fruitful insofar it's got its relationship with Jesus, and that there's purpose and there's meaning in all of that. And that was indeed a very common picture in Jesus' day. the people of Jesus' day, the, the Israelites, for them, the, the, the symbol of grapes or a vineyard or the vine, uh, that went part and parcel with who they were as a nation. So much so, in, in similarity to what we might regard, fish and chips always go together. If you remember way back in the early part of the, the Bible, Numbers chapter 13, when the people of Israel were in the wilderness and they were wanting to find out what the promised land was like, and Moses had sent 10 spies out into uh, the promised land to see what it was like. And in many ways, their experience was like the, that experience that an Irish man would get and going in to see America and seeing everything was so big and so fantastic and so amazing. And they came back and they told Moses what this place, or sorry, they uh, told Joshua what this place was was really like. Uh, Sorry, this thing is still not doing what it should be doing. Um, and And they came, but what did they come back with in that situation? What was the thing they brought from the promised land? Can you remember? It was a cluster of grapes. It was a cluster of grapes that was so big that it took two men to carry it on a pole. One single cluster of grapes. If you were to go into the the temple in Jesus' day, there was an image just above the entrance that the porch, and it was a golden vine, which was again trying to portray this image of fruitfulness and effectiveness and growth. Whenever the Israelites eventually rebelled against the the Roman authorities and they were trying to assert their own independence and they made their own coins, what image did they put on the coins? But they put the image of a vine or a grape on the front of that. So this image was so common in the, amongst the people of Israel that they really thought this represented who they were. And when you read the Bible, you read the Old Testament time and again, there were many, many illustrations, sometimes negative, sometimes positive. If I get a positive, you've got Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 5, taking the picture of God who is planting the vineyard. It says, he took one of the seedlings of the land, he put it in fertile soil. It had been planted in good soil by abundant water so that it would produce branches, bear fruit, and become a splendid vine. But then there's also the negative side. Again, the picture of God planting a vineyard representing the nation of Israel and how he as a father was looking after the nation. It says, Isaiah 5 verse 2, it says, He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. So the image of the the grapes or the vine is trying to represent this is what you are to be, fruitful. You are to be uh, successful in that sense as far as you are following God. There is to be those evidences of a rewarding life, living life as God intended you to live life. So looking more specifically at what this actually means for us, uh, 
What does it mean to actually bear fruit? And as I was thinking just about this, and it's, and it's, I mean, it's in these verses, if you look down at verse 5 and verse 8 and verse 16, where it talks about, you have been appointed to go and bear fruit. My father is the gardener, I'm the vine. You are to go and bear much fruit. Down the end of verse 16, you are to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So what does this actually mean? to bear fruit, and there's a couple of aspects I could easily think, many more perhaps, but one of those things in terms of what it means to to actually bear fruit is to speak the gospel, that you speak about Jesus to other people. We know that all over this world, the, the gospel is growing and God is doing amazing things. You can see what he's doing in Africa. You can see what he's doing in South America. You can see what, what he's doing in China. And yet we in Europe are the ones that are sort of falling behind. And so often it's because we, we are afraid of actually speaking and being known as followers of Jesus Christ. Like some of you will know that we have been doing some, or some of us have been doing some discipleship training and in the anticipation of developing a little bit more what it means to, to, to be a, a disciple and honoring Jesus Christ here in this place. One of the little things that I was, we were tasked to do and for this incoming week was to think about two people that you could invite to church. And yet, when we realize, when you put it down into concrete, specific terms like that, not just something that we leave in our heads and that we think is a good idea, but something, as it were, has a name attached to it to realize this is something that we really can do and that we can bear for it by speaking the gospel, doing something about it. And so if that's one as one simple aspect about what it means to bear fruit and other things is maybe our, our, our personal holiness. Again, going back to Galatians 5, 22, remember the term that the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and so forth. And when we read that, we know there's nine aspects to that. And we can be content as long as I've got one or two of them. Couldn't expect me to have all nine, could you? And we can sort of sit back and we can say, well, I'll work on my patience and that's all I'm going to do, but the others I'm, I'm not so concerned about. But really, what Galatians 5.22 and, and the fruitfulness and the fruit that's mentioned there is really about is in many ways like one of those fruit smoothies that you can buy and you go in and there's coconut and there's banana and there's strawberries and there's raspberries and there's kiwi and it's all blended together into one thing and that's what we are to be to be expressive of what it means to know and honor and love Jesus simply by what we do who we are how we treat others it's it's our personal holiness if there's one thing that does annoy me I'm sure it annoys you too it's getting a certain type of phone call, a phone call, and then it begins by telling you that you have been chosen for a prize. Now, you know it's not real. It just makes me grumpy. But in those serious moments when you really have been chosen to get something or to be something, that's altogether different when it's sincere. But as we read what Jesus is saying here, and what we're really looking at is the fact is that Jesus has chosen you. Is that what it says here? He has chosen you to go and bear fruit. This is something that you have been called by him to do. And glancing down in in verses 2 and verse 5, There's various amounts of fruit that people have. It talks here about some people having no fruit, some people having some, some people having much, some people having more. And so the question that that sort of we are left with is, well, what is our basket like in terms of what we actually show in terms of being fruitful for God? So that's a simple way into thinking what it actually means to bear fruit. How do we bear fruit? And Jesus wants to encourage you to bear fruit. And some of the ways that he goes about that may actually be something that we don't like. And the the first aspect of that is pruning. Verse 2, 
He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. And that's taking this aspect that sometimes God is working in your life and doing things that we may not like because pruning is not a, an easy experience. It's, it's invasive, it's difficult, it's challenging. And yet the purpose of why Jesus is doing that is to make you more fruitful. So sometimes when you're reading the Bible, you're reading the Bible at home and you're reading something there that challenges you. It cuts across your normal way of living. It's challenging you about how you might respond to other people or to a situation. And that is God pruning you. Or even in your life, there may be things happening in your life which are really challenging and difficult right now. And you may be immediately asking the question, why is this happening to me? Why do I have to endure this? Why do I have to go through this? And what God is doing is that God is pruning you so that you might be more fruitful. So if God is, and Jesus is pruning in your life to make you fruitful, well, another simple thing in verse four uh, is that is encouraging you to remain. Remain in me and I also will remain in you. So we need to stay close to Christ, connected to him. So that I think encourages our fruitfulness or even looking down to verse seven and I'm challenged by verse seven where Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, do whatever you ask and it will be done for you. And as we read that, that might seem a bit like a, a blank check. You can ask for whatever you want and you're going to get it. But of course, the reality is, is that if you're remaining in Jesus, if you're close to Jesus, you probably know the sort of things that he's going to be getting you to pray for. And our problem isn't the fact that we're going to be asking for these blank checks and God to provide for whatever we need. But I think our main challenge and our main problem is that we do not ask enough and we do not ask enough because we're always feeling that sense of disappointment if God says no. And so what this verse is saying is that we need to have that faith. And ultimately and beyond a little bit where we actually read in verses 9 and 10, it says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love and if you keep my commands you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love and it's about obeying. So if I've thought about what it means in a general sense to be fruitful, how Jesus encourages you, that's how he wants to encourage you to be fruitful and that he's doing things in your life, around your life. He's encouraging you to remain in him. He's encouraging you to obey him. My last little thought is, why? Why does Jesus want us to be fruitful? And the simple answer is in verse 8. What it's all about is that this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. See, it's not for our reputation, it's not for our glory, it's not for our honor, it is for Jesus, it is for God's glory, it is for our Father's glory. And this is the message for us, that we should be the people that God is calling us to be today. Do we want to be the church of Jesus Christ that he's calling us to be? Do we want to find, experience this sense of satisfaction, living a life as God intends our lives to be lived? In fact, we are called to do the things that Israel in the Old Testament failed to do. And as I read that, and I, I hope it's the same for you, that surely there's something in this that resonates in your heart that, it, that is saying, this is what I really want to be. This is who I want to be. This is what God is calling me to do. And, and I can't simply leave this in my head, but I want to do something about it. I want to be fruitful and to bear fruit for Jesus Christ because I recognize I have been chosen by God to do this. Me, you. Now, a few of you 
I'm sure we'll have heard of a guy called Larry Walters. The time of the incident, I'm going to tell you the story of. He was a 33-year-old uh, living in San Pedro, not far from Los Angeles. And on, on most weekends, he just sat around like most people, watching sport and doing the odd thing like that. But one day, he decided to do something completely different. And he went out on the Saturday afternoon, and he bought himself 44 weather balloons. And then when he got them, he came back, he got a deck chair, he secured the deck chair to the ground, and then he tied and inflated the weather balloons to the deck chair. Then he got his air gun, he sat in the deck chair, he must obviously have secured himself to the deck chair, and then he cut the ropes, and off he drifted into the sky. It wasn't long before Air traffic control at Los Angeles Airport were getting strange messages from incoming aircraft saying, you are not going to believe this, but there is a guy floating up here at 16,000 feet on a deck chair. After a while, he got bored, and I've had enough, I've done this, and so he got his air gun and he started to pop the balloons. And so that began his descent. And 45 minutes later, he descended and touched ground on Long Beach, seven miles from where he had started. And the police arrested him. And they asked him the question, what were you doing? And his response was, I just had to do it. Now, as we listen to Jesus today, and Jesus is giving us that encouragement to go and bear fruit. And yet our response at times so often is that we just end up just sitting there. But when we have a sense of what our Father has done for us in Jesus, when we have a sense that we could never put ourselves right with God because of our sin and that we have been alienated from God because of our sin, because we realize that heaven was always beyond us and we could never get there ourselves, but that in Jesus, his son, God has put us right with him so that we can be in a right relationship with God. And when we just have that sense that my sins are forgiven and that I can find satisfaction and fullness in Jesus Christ, and when the Holy Spirit fills my life, and, I, and again, when that really begins to, to sink into our consciousness so that we know that we really cannot be the same people. We cannot be unaffected by all of this. And as this truth becomes large in our thinking, then we know that our lives have purpose and meaning and satisfaction. And that that satisfaction can only be found in Jesus. It's, it's not found in anywhere out in, in our modern society and where they might think, and going back to what Jim Carrey was thinking about as I was relating that story about the beginning, and no matter what people think is the most important or that people encourage you to think is the most important, but truly, this life, this life that is found in Jesus is the only thing that gives purpose and meaning and satisfaction. And that's what I encourage you to find if you haven't already found that today. Or if you have, and you have just been sitting around like Larry Walters, that you would find that as God pushes you and shoves you and nudges you, that you will find that this is what you are called to do when you recognize that Jesus has chosen you and that Jesus has chosen you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last and that will be for his glory wherever he has set you and wherever he calls you to live for him. Let's just pause in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, may your word dwell deeply in our hearts. So as we might know that it is 
simply you and by your Holy Spirit who is speaking and ministering to us. Make it unmistakable that we know, Lord, that it is your voice and that you speak deep within us. Help us so that we cannot push that word away. We cannot run from you and that we will come to you. Lord, help us to go and bear fruit for you, fruit that will last. Amen.